Hey, this is Jason DeLine, also known as Drago. Thanks for watching Baku Talk. Hello, brothers, and welcome back to the Baku Talking Longer Podcast. I'm Haru Ren, and I got another special guest for you here today. You may know him as the voice of Ben K in the Beyblade series. He has also appeared in various comic book adaptations like Arrow and also the X Men series, uh, more specifically, X Men Apocalypse and X Men Days of Future Past. But some of you may know him as uh, Jenkins, the but China Rides butler in Bakugan, as well as the legendary Drago, both in the Legacy series and the Reboot series. So here he is, the legend himself, Jason DeLine. How are you doing, man? Oh, hey, thanks for having me here, Haru. Nice to be here. <laughs> it's, so, it's so nice to have you on. Uh, you, like, uh, you're, uh, you arguably are actually the second voice actor from my childhood to actually come on to, uh, come on to the show. Uh, the other being Devin Very Mack. Cool. Uh, Oh, but, nice! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like you voiced Drago oh, in the yeah. Legacy series, and uh, you and now you're back again after seven long years. <laughs> seven long years, yeah, yeah. I've put a lot of hours in uh, as uh, this particular dragon. <laughs> How? Uh, but like uh, for Drago, uh, that, this is like such a this is such a wild uh, wild thing. Uh, you voiced Drago in the Legacy series, and all of a sudden. You come back uh, for the reboot, uh, so I just want to know, like, how did that come about? I'm not like I'm not asking for numbers or anything, but uh, how did Spin Master approach you for voicing Drago? Did you have to re-audition for the role, or did they offer it to you like immediately? Well, um, it was interesting. So uh, by the time they decided to resurrect the franchise, a lot of people had come and gone from Spin Master, so. Uh, and and that that trickled down to every aspect of the business. You know, production studios had different people involved, uh, agencies, uh, people who worked at the production companies, and and like I said, people at Spin Master. So a lot of the relationships sort of weren't um, being maintained. Like people didn't know how to find all the actors from the previous series. Uh, you know, they would just think probably that we all moved on to other things. So. They just sent out audition notices like they would with any new television show. So my agent sent me this thing, and um, it said uh, it was for Drago. And in the email note, uh, there was a, a clip, and it said, listen to this clip. This is the voice we want. And it was a clip of me. It was, it was Drago <laughs> from Bakugan. And I thought, well, if I can't do me i don't belong in this business <laughs> so uh so yeah i um it, a lot had changed since the first time i had auditioned for for drago uh, that was very early in my voice acting career and i feel like i've gotten to know the character and helped to shape the character over the years so i felt very comfortable going in and auditioning for for the character again and uh and then i found out that i booked it so i was very happy so they, booked, um, but, uh, so they booked you right like right away. Well, uh, I, I don't, I don't. It's been a while now, actually. I think that was around, I want to say, 2018. So about four years ago now. Um, I, I think I did it from home. I think I sent uh, the audition from home, and I probably had a note on there at the end that was just like, "By the way, I, I was the one who played Drago in the first place. If you want that consistency or whatever." And then they brought me in, and uh, and it, and it was um, uh, Deb Toffin was uh, was directing. She had directed the last few episodes of the, or maybe the last couple seasons of the original run. Uh, Matt Skull was the was the casting guy and and director, the voice director for most of the original run of the Legacy series, and then Deb finished it off, and then she started the new one, and now we have Susan Hart, who is another uh, great animation director. But um, but yeah, there it was probably within a week that I that I heard that they wanted to bring me back, and I was happy. I, I felt pretty confident because they said they wanted to have the same voice. They weren't looking to go in a new direction so i thought well you know as long as i'm not so old i'm talking like this now i should still be able to do the old dragon so yeah i got into the deep voice again and got the gravel going and uh and yeah the rest is history <laughs> and you know and you know what uh the reception to you coming back has been 100 percent positive everybody in the community has been clamoring they saw jason deline is coming back as drago and they and everyone just went wild 
right? So, and uh, I love that. Uh, <laughs> I love that they kept up with that continuity. Like, uh, arguably, you were the one that made Drago the character uh, the way uh, the way <laughs> he is now, and like the dragon that everybody loves. You can't like when the Bakugan reboot was announced. Obviously, you can't have Bakugan without. Dragonoid, right? And you were the one that made that character. Uh, well, thank you. And, and uh, the way <laughs> that everyone loves. How does it feel actually to be welcomed back into uh, Bakugan with such open arms? Oh well, it's uh, it's it's been incredible, honestly. You know, um, I also played Benkei in Beyblade, and and not everybody liked what I did with that character. I, I kind of took a big swing with that character. I made him goofy, and the idea for me with Benkei was that. He was this big kind of bully guy when he started, and I yeah. I wanted to play him against type. I wanted to make him seem gentler. So he just has this kind of cartoon voice, and it's it's kind of against like what that character would sound like in traditional anime. And so some people didn't like it, some people loved it. Um, but my idea was that I believed, even though he started out as kind of a bully, he was kind of goofy, and. I wanted to leave room for him to be able to be redeemed. And I believe that's exactly what happened with Benkei. Eventually he became some of the good guys. He's always had an edge to him, but you know, he became more of a likable guy. But um, with Drago, um, you know, they seemed to like from the very beginning, the, the fans, what I was doing with them. And uh, I wanted him to be big and gruff, but I also wanted him to be well spoken. Um, he he sort of speaks with a, a a better diction than other people in the in the world, and he doesn't always use contractions. Uh, but sometimes he does. He's learned a little bit from Dan over the years. Um, but yeah, I uh, I basically am trying to do the best version of me when I do Drago. Um, I think of Drago as kind and brave. Um, but that he makes mistakes and uh, he's not above saying sorry. Uh, you know, I, I really like the tender moments with him and Dan too. And, you know, for me, uh, even though he, his temper gets the best of him sometimes and, he, and uh, he gets into a battle and gets angry and stuff, I do feel that he's level headed and smart. Um, and hopefully you can hear that in the portrayal. Like, I see him as a, as a hero. And everything that makes up a hero, you know, um, I wanted him to be someone people looked up to. So many people, so many ro male role models that we've had over the years have had what we call this toxic um, masculinity. And I know people like to label that on a lot of things and people are resistant to that idea of male toxicity. But what I think of is when, when I think of something that is um, toxic masculinity, I think of people who are tough and they see people who are sensitive as being lame. And so I thought, hey, if a big, tough, fire-breathing dragon can be sensitive and empathetic, uh, why can't anybody, you know? Um, and uh, if that makes people defensive or uncomfortable, I hope they ask themselves why that makes them defensive or uncomfortable, you know, maybe, Maybe they're not comfortable expressing their own emotions. And usually that boils down to anger, which is, which is just fear. And uh, I, think that, I think that Drago understands that. I think that Drago understands that um, emotional creatures are volatile creatures and we have to keep our emotions in check. And there's nothing wrong with being vulnerable and sensitive and kind because he's also courageous. He, he gets in there and he fights the fight when it has to be done, but... You know, he, he also, his main thing is being there for his friends, and he's accountable. If he makes mistakes, he owns up to it and he apologizes for it. He doesn't always believe he's right. Sometimes he argues with other people, but if someone changes his mind, he'll let them change their mind. And I think that's an important thing for kids to see, that teamwork is important, and that you should never be unwilling to change your mind when when new data presents itself or someone else has an opinion, you know? Um, so there's just a lot about that character. I think the way they've written him that makes him really emotionally rich. And I've really tried to pay attention when I read those scripts to see where are those moments that I can show a little more empathy 
or a little bit of restraint or humility because we don't always see it in everything. And um, I see Drago as someone who leads by example. So I'm thrilled that I've been able to play that character and that people of all walks of life have come up to me and said that character and that relationship with Dan resonates with them. And yeah, it's... Uh, it's really powerful. Uh, I've been fortunate. You know, we did have a break between the two uh, series, um, but it honestly, it feels like it went by pretty quickly. Uh, of course, I was doing other things, shooting films and, and directing and things like that, teaching my uh, my workshops. But uh, going to conventions, I was meeting fans all the time that said, oh, man, Drago was such a big part of my life. You know, and these are people maybe now who are in their late teens and they're saying, and here's my little brother or sister who's also into it now. And so we were always thinking, you know, like, man, like this thing is going beyond the first generation of people who watched it and they're growing up and still interested. So I was so excited when they wanted to bring it back because I said, you know what, we've already got a built-in fan base of the, of the OG people who watched it, the fans who kept it alive, and then their younger brothers and sisters. And now we have a new generation getting into this show and all three of those are watching it. So, you know... Uh, it's pretty awesome to be back in there. And, and like you said, it's nice to have the continuity. People do appreciate that, to have some of the, the OG people come back. And uh, yeah, so that was a very long answer. But uh, to put it shortly, it's been fantastic. I really appreciate all the fans. We wouldn't be here without you. Um, this is such a unique thing where the game plays in with the, the cartoon in a, in a way that I think is better than previous you know, used to used to be when Batman had a cartoon, they would try to sell as many Batman figures as possible. So they'd be like, now he has a harpoon gun on his hand and it glows <laughs> in the dark, you know. But but like all this stuff has to do with the actual way the game is played. And uh, do you play the game still? Yeah, yeah, I definitely, yeah. Yeah? It's, I played the, cool. I like uh, the, the original game, I think was like th uh, three gate cards and three ability cards, uh, three Bakugan, right? right? And now we yeah, it was eight. much harder. I found that game much harder to roll and, and get them to pop up. But uh, the new version, it's a little easier for me. It's still complicated. It goes over my head a bit. But Because uh, like, uh, the new fun. game is like a full TCG, right? You have 40 cards and all that. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty intense. So you, <laughs> and so you actually play the, the, video the new game, game now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I've also played the video game that came out for PS3 because, uh, you know, they had the cast, the, the original cast involved with that. Yes. Um, but it was hard. I didn't get far enough to even hear my voice in that game. Oh, oh really? <laughs> yeah. uh, I, th but it was I played the game on stream and I finished the game. <laughs> oh, good for you. And, uh, awesome. your, and uh, yeah, your performance, great as usual. <laughs> oh, good to hear. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, and Lion Smith in the, uh, was was in that too. I think he he played the character that you play, um, if I have that correctly. Lion Smith so, was the uh, created character. He was also Masquerade in the original show. Yeah, so. That's right. He was Masquerade in the original. Originally, actually, he was cast as Drago. Actually, what? Uh, yeah, yeah. He did a, a few episodes as Drago, and then um, I think the production company decided that they wanted someone who sounded a little meaner. Um, because Lion's a sweetheart, and of course he has tons of great range. He's great at playing those really youthful characters. Um, he can do stuff with his voice that he can sound younger, and, and I can't do that. I, I have an older, gruffer, deeper voice. Um, sometimes I can get into the into the teen area, but but he's really good at at, uh, at at really bringing the drama and the action to his characters. It's just awesome. So uh, you know, I felt I felt bad that he didn't. Uh, he didn't book Drago, but I felt good that I did and that he got to do other things like Masquerade and people love Masquerade yes. and he's got to do a bunch of other things too. He's a great musician and he works in theater and stuff. Uh, yeah, it's cool. So it, it's good that uh, I'm glad the OGs are doing all these different things as well. <laughs> good that the OGs are like fine and, and uh, you know, and then there's a, there's we got like new voice cast uh, and so that kids can experience more newer uh, more newer actors so that they can that they can look up to. Obviously, we have Margarita Valderrama as Leah, Julius Cho as oh, Magnus. Uh, I know yeah. everybody loves Julius Cho. Uh, and then yeah, and he's he's so new to all this, and he's just exploding. He's doing fantastic. Yeah, yeah. he's a really nice guy too. Yeah, yeah, it's great to have him on this. You got to you uh, got to know him when you were uh, recording uh, the show a little bit. Yeah, w once that uh, once we started this next series, we did sort of a, a meet and greet little uh, 
dinner thing where we had, you know, Mac and Julius put it on, I think. And so, you know, yeah, Tinkler was there and I was there. And uh, um, yeah, so we had some food together and some drinks and we played the game together. I think we might have shot a couple of videos of that um, oh, that Julius put on his those. <laughs> What's that? They need to release those. <laughs> I think I think Julius might have put him on his Twitter. So if you if you cycle through there, you might find it. Oh, I got, yeah, I got to hunt through his Twitter then. <laughs> yeah, it's a few years ago. He might be able to help you out with that. But yeah, so it, it is very rare um, that we all get to be in the same room together because most of, they're all in Toronto and I'm in Vancouver now. So I do it from my home studio uh, remotely. They all they all hook up to me and. Uh, uh, so I and, but plus we never recorded together anyway. It was always one at a time. Um, oh. That was one thing I really loved working on My Little Pony, which I did here in Vancouver. Is that they brought the whole cast in to a big room, with like fifteen microphones in a circle, and we just do it like it was a radio play. We just performed it from beginning to end. We're all there for like two or three hours, and anytime we need to redo something, the director's just like, "Let's do that that again. Start at this line." And then if there's any direction, he'll do it. But usually it's just people are interrupted or, you know, they got a funny sound in their throat or anything, something. So that was a beautiful, fast way to do it. Um, and uh, it, the hard thing is just scheduling everybody and having a space and enough microphones to do it. Um, but, yeah, that was that was wonderful because you get to play off each other's energy and look each other in the eye. And, and that was really fun to have Ashley in there and Sarah to do the... Uh, um, the parents of uh, Rainbow Dash and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it was super fun. I think it's important though, because like as an actor, you have to be able to see uh, people's faces and stuff, and and to play off your emotion and not play off their emotions in order to make yourself seem better, huh? It is preferable, but uh, you also just have to be able to roll with the punches. There's a whole bunch of different, and and you know, in the last two years, a lot of things have changed. Where even in Toronto, people weren't going into the studio as much. We, we all had to learn how to do a little more from our home studio. So that's been great. I mean, it's nice not to have to put shoes on and stuff, but uh, you can um, you can work in yeah, your pajamas. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and who knows what's in my coffee mug when I'm at home? <laughs> It's just coffee. <laughs> this is one of my favorite things, by the way. My uh, my wife gave me this for my birthday oh, um, that, that a few years ago. Yeah, so I'll, I'll do you mind if I read it to you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, read it so, in your Drago voice, though. <laughs> if you okay, can. well, it won't make much sense in my Drago voice, but I will. Um, so I one one time on the Danforth in Toronto, I found an, in this dollar store near um, this place called the SoCap Theater. It's a uh, it's a comedy and, and improv place in Toronto, a great place on the east side of Toronto. And uh, sometimes before going in there for classes or performing or whatever, I'd, I'd pop into the dollar store and just see if they have any fun toys or whatever. So they would often have knockoff toys, like, you know, stuff that's not officially licensed. So they had this Batman figure, and it looked terrible, just this, like, rubber thing. And they had a picture from Batman Begins on the front. And then on the back, they had the bio of Batman, and I, uh, I took a picture of it because it was so hilarious. I should have bought it. And I told my wife it was my favorite thing in the world. I thought it was so funny. It makes me cry whenever I read it. It's so funny. And um, so she got it printed on a mug. So this is the biography of Batman according to a dollar store toy. And I'll do it in Drago. Batman begins. When being a child, Bruce Wayne had witnessed with his own eyes the fact his parents of millionaire were killed cruelly so affected his strong desire of revenging his parents. However, God had never given him a chance to fulfill his will. Following the advice of Ra's al Ghul, the chief of ninja group, Bruce come to Geet, which was a corrupted city filled with various crime groups. Bruce found a basement under his villa, in which the equipments turned him into another person. Spider-Man. <laughs> with this mask, Spider-Man stroke all criminal activates and criminals everywhere, such as Tugon, the chief of mafia, Dr. Jack Straw, the abnormal drug trafficker, even a mysterious opponent quite familiar with him. So this, uh, <laughs> that makes me laugh every time I read it. They just totally got, for some reason, this Batman Begins bio mentions Spider-Man twice. <laughs> They're not even in the same universe. Oh, I thought, you were, I thought you were, I thought you were, I thought you said Spider-Man as a joke. <laughs> No, man. It actually says that? It says Spider-Man. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Turns him into a, another person. Spider-Man. 
uh, is that backwards? I guess it's backwards. Oh no, no, no! It's uh, it's no? it's front face forward. It's backwards. <laughs> okay, I got the mirror image. You can tell I don't do a lot of video interviews. Oh, and this is my other mug, Dog Dad. I love this one too. Your dog is into uh, Bakugan, as you put it on the uh, this, on the uh, official uh, Discord. Yeah, yeah, you saw him ho holding on to that season one from the from the Legacy series of, of DVDs. It's probably a collector's item now. <laughs> it, yes, it it actually is. Uh, I suggest is keeping that. I think I've okay. seen it go for quite a bit. Oh, I should sign it and I don't know, do a claw mark on it or bite it or something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's been a while since I've been to a convention too. You know, we we used to have fun going to those. Uh, I've been to one in Seattle. I've been to a couple in Toronto. I'd like to, I'd like to do more because um, I do have fans from all over, uh, well, all over the world, really, mainly in the states, who are saying, you know, come to come to our conventions. And uh, I just keep saying, you gotta you gotta tell the people at the convention you want you want us to come, and and we'll do what we can. Um, and it's I, I'd like to do a thing with uh, the monster truck. There's a Drago monster truck now. Oh, you which saw is that? Pretty... Huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're, we're talking a little bit about maybe doing some things. It's uh, it's just uh, getting me to those places. But yeah, how fun would it be for me to be the announcer when uh, when the Drago truck comes out? I yeah, that would be, that would be sick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be a lot of fun. That'd and be, I think it'd be brings th like uh, that'd be bigger than it. the Rock announcing the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, <laughs> but I appreciate that. <laughs> but speaking of like the legacy series, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, Scott McCord is the one who played the original Dan Cuso, but now uh, sure. we're going to the reboot. Now it's Jonah Weinberg uh, playing mm -hmm. Dan the new Dan Cuso. How different do you feel uh, a connection between Scott McCord's Dan Cuso and uh, Jonah Weinberg's Dan Cuso? That's a uh that's a good question. Um, you know, when we first started the first series, um, Scott was a few years older than me, and he was much more he had much more experience than I did in voice acting. And uh, I sort of deferred to him at the time. You know, I was still trying to find my voice with Drago, and uh, I felt that that version of Dan, the way that Scott did it, he kind of almost had like a chip on his shoulder. He was like very cocky as Dan. And I felt like I was sort of brought into, well, Drago sort of brought in to sort of bring him down a peg, you know, to sort of keep him humble. Um, and, and that was really fun to, to sort of see Dan like go, oh, I can do anything. And then and then he immediately couldn't. Um, and I go, well, try to stay calm, Dan, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but now Jonah is a few years younger than me. And so now it's a little bit more like I feel more comfortable in this character and that so I'm bringing him in not just as Dan but as a new voice actor to this thing of ba Bakugan and going you know um, almost as a father figure and so like it's this guidance and this gentle you know thing with him and but at times it also feels like kind of a brotherly love type of thing I think in this new series they've really worked on um, their dynamic and and making them partners and work together and they, and they make sure to have those quiet moments so it's been cool to explore that um and the first bakugan it started with the meeting of of drago and dan and they sort of had to get to know each other and discover this relationship but in the new series it kind of feels like very quickly they got to a, a comfort a comfortable place and i like that i i like that we've already seen them sort of figure it all out but in this new one it was like we know who these guys are. Let's throw them together and, and show this friendship they have, um, which is really cool. You know, uh, I feel like in the years since I've grown as a person and an actor and I've, you know, I'm not having to force Drago all the time and always make him be angry. You know, I, I think that was what I tried to do in the beginning. There's all this battling going on. Um, but now I feel like, like I said before, I'm trying to play Drago as more emotionally intelligent, which I think is more interesting. So anytime I can be quieter, um, I do. Because um, often when there's a lot of noise going around, the one person who goes, hey, let's talk about this, sometimes that will cut through. That seems more dramatic, you know, than just adding to the noise. So, um, so yeah, it's been a journey, and I, I'm definitely not the same Drago I was when I started, but... Uh, but yeah, I, I'm very grateful for both Scott and Jonah. They've both given me so much to play off of, and, and there are different levels of experience and different energies as the character 
really gave me a lot to work with. Um, yeah, so I'm just really thankful for both of them. And I think, uh, I think the fans will like both of them too. I, I think they're both really good guys. They've both been kind to me in and outside of the studio. Uh, they've been kind to their fans. Um, so it's one of those rare things, I think, where people aren't necessarily saying one is better than the other. It's just as time goes by, we, we have someone new, and uh, it's great to see people appreciate both. Yeah. Uh, and I, yeah. I certainly do. Yeah, we definitely appreciate both of them. Uh, obvious and uh, obviously, like uh, we've spoken to Jonah before uh, on this uh, on the show, and he does uh, actually look up to you, uh, like try to guide him into this world of Bakugan. Uh, I do like how you describe Drago, though, try, uh, in this reboot series, trying to be like more emo more emotionally sensitive and trying to set mm -hmm. an example for uh, fu for like future generations of people that watch. You know that uh, yeah. yeah, there it is. That's 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 the character right there. That's like spot I, I on. think it's important. Important uh, for people to see that stuff, you know. Um, I uh, it bugs me when I hear people these days sometimes uh, immediately um, go against something because they say it's woke, uh, or people are attacking something for trying to be more diverse. Um, but you know, diversity can mean a lot of things. It can be including characters from different racial backgrounds, uh, different abilities. Um, accents, beliefs, genders, sexual orientations, and um, you know, most of the content truthfully that's been made over the years has been exclusionary in some way. Um, and, and I feel like people don't really understand what the intent is of, of trying to be more diverse. Um, but uh, for me, it's just about including as many people as we can. Let's, you know, it's important for people to see themselves on screen. And uh, Pushing those boundaries is important. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years, too, about, like, people playing people of color when they're not. And um, and I definitely feel that I shouldn't be playing a person of color. Um, and people might say, well, the voice is the same. It doesn't matter. But I can't, I can't carry the history of what it's like to be a, a person of color. I can't play someone and have that history of everything they've been through that I can't relate to, you know? Yeah. And believe it or not, that they, they bring that to all the stories they tell. And I can't bring that to that, honestly, no matter how much research I do. Yeah, can I pretend to be a garbage man in something? Sure. But can I pretend that I have been uh, raised as an indigenous person and I know all the struggles that they've had to deal with and then it was I'm performing it do I uh, do I know if that dialogue rings true? No. Uh, so so I'm I'm very uh, I'm very much um, a proponent of you know bringing in as many people as we can to tell the stories truthfully and authentically, and it makes it more fun. It makes the it makes the show more interesting, more authentic, and just more people get to play that haven't been able to play before. It just has not been a level playing field, you know? It's been a predominantly white dude um, career. And, you know, there's there's so many voices, so many characters. There's room for everybody to play. So, yeah, Hank Azaria, you're a multi-million dollar, multi-millionaire. You don't need to play a poo, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, let's, let's cast that authentically. Although with that character, I don't know, I don't know how they could make it authentic because it was always written sort of as a caricature and a parody so that they might just have retired the character. Uh, anyway, sorry, I'm going off on a bit of a no, tangent, no, but, but no, these, no. All, these things are all uh, important to me. And uh, to me, I think it's important for, uh, you know, us white guys to, to make sure we're saying, yeah, this is, this is the way it should be. Um, us white guys shouldn't be playing everything and we shouldn't be afraid of losing jobs. We should be excited for these shows to become richer by including more people who can tell more stories that we can't tell. Yeah, and that's you know that's an important message to uh, get out, you know, and uh, you know, uh, it, no, it's uh, it's no problem that you uh, like uh, went went off uh, went the way you did because like uh, you know it's very important to talk about, you know, and uh, I and I feel yeah. like uh, you know uh, not like uh, Bakugan uh, the reboot has been uh, very inclusive without being like so heavily obvious to it, you know. Devin, uh, we got <laughs> Devin playing uh, Winton, Margarita's playing Leah. We uh, yeah. 
Touch Shun being played by uh, Jamie Joe Gonzaga. Uh, Yukal Schillingford is able to bring his heritage into a uh, Trox even. It's so right, so great, man. I love it, and uh, and I love that the that the fans at home are seeing this, and uh, they might be saying, "Hey, like if they can do it, I can do it." You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think it's I think it's great, and and we need more of it. And uh, you know, I'm not I'm not saying the show is perfect. Uh, I don't think any show is because you know. We also have to look at behind the scenes. Are uh, are we giving uh, are we giving more chances to animators and writers and producers to people outside of the bubble that usually does it? You know, um, and I think uh, I think when the people who are already doing it, the people in power, are talking about it, I think that's really important. Um, you know, sometimes things get lost on deaf ears when it's the people saying. What about us? Why not include us? So like, and then the people in power are, are silent or saying, well, if they worked harder or, well, I don't want to put my job at risk. Um, no, it's us people who are already in the business who should be championing those ideas, too, because, you know, we're being listened to. We're already at the top of the pile. So we have to make sure we're talking about these issues, too, because we're the ones who actually make the change happen, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, exactly, and uh, that's yeah, that's and it should reflect the world. We live in a in a, div a beautifully diverse world, yeah. and you know, if I go to if I go to a, any public school, I'm going to meet all kinds of people and hear their stories and interact, and my life is going to be richer for it. So, trying to keep those stories out of mainstream media is doing everyone a dis a disservice, mm -hmm. and some people just need to change a little bit about the way that they look at it and the way they appreciate it, and if they if they're open to it. Um, it'll make their lives more richer, and hopefully we'll, we'll all get along a little better. The power of a cartoon, man. World <laughs> peace. Um, I honestly do think animation is this great secret weapon where we can um, do a lot of things that you won't see in mainstream uh, live-action TV and movies. Um, we, we can get away with some subject matter and, um, and uh, stories and characters that would just be focus groups to death if it was done in live action. We got to make sure it's the right thing for the right people. People are going to criticize this. But a lot of times animation can fly under the radar. Uh, a lot of critics or politicians won't look at that as closely. And so it is a great place, I think, to instill um, great values into kids who we know are watching these shows. And the more they see uh, a more real version of the world around them, you know, some of these people are living in a very small town that doesn't have a lot of diversity, that doesn't have a lot of different types of people and stories. If they can watch something that is more representative of the real world, that's better for them, and they'll function better in the world as they get older. Yeah, as uh, when I was a kid, uh, the way I taught myself uh, more about, like, different cultures or different, uh, like, just know that there are different people out there other than me uh, was actually just watching cartoons. I, rem I remember watching so much uh, old uh, Canadian cartoons like uh, Flying Rhino Junior High, uh, Teenage Mutant <laughs> Ninja Turtles, uh, and uh, yeah. one, uh, uh, one of them that you were on, actually, Totally Spies. Uh, yep. That, that you were on. I, uh, but... Uh, yeah, uh, that's how that's you know that's how I learned uh, how I that uh, how like there's more people out there in the world other than myself just watching cartoons and I totally agree with you. Cartoons and animation definitely it sounds like a gateway to like teaching kids more about the world uh, at large. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And there's a there's a lot of new stuff coming out too. I, I I've been to a couple of animation conventions, uh, more for creators, not for for fans and uh, and actors and stuff. But just talking to people about different things that are in the works, and uh, it's amazing to see the stuff that's that's coming out of there. Um, you know, there even uh, people who have uh, like amputated limbs and things like that put in uh, into cartoons. You know, it's funny because like you'll sometimes hear parents say, oh, I don't want them seeing that, that's disturbing or whatever, because it's uncomfortable for them because they haven't grown up with it. They're not used to it. But yeah. kids are like sponges, man, and they can, they, can, they can accept a lot of new things as they're still learning and they're still young. And if we present these things as normal, then the people, they will hopefully be more um, welcoming to, to people who are different from them and the people who are different from them uh, actually will start to feel like they're not so different. Uh, everybody's unique, everybody's special, but we all belong to this world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So I'd like to see more of that. 
yeah it de- yeah definitely and you know when it comes to bakugan i know there are a lot of people that are seeing themselves in certain characters even their background characters uh even uh and there, i know that there's people uh that have said that they see themselves in drago actually mm. one of my favorite episodes that i uh when we're seeing the reboots uh is uh it's called brawl for it all it was when uh, magnus's team is facing uh, the awesome brawlers and then the, right. there's this heart-to-heart conversation that you and jonah have and i thought that was an amazing amazing acting between you yeah. two you know thank like, you like drago can't, um, drago can't evolve and he's so afraid that uh what dan will do like like he's so afraid that dan will abandon him or something just because he can't evolve but then dan right. assures him no we, we if we stay together we will uh, we'll always uh we'll always be winners and i and yeah. you know, and you guys actually took that to the next level in armored alliance uh when dan was being controlled by havoc and then drago was able to infiltrate dan's <laughs> subconscious and then uh, yeah. reminded him, "Hey, remember when I couldn't? Ev- remember when I couldn't evolve? You told me as long as we stick together, we'll always be together." You know, I love like uh, the dynamic that you and Jonah actually have, and I know, I know for uh, those for those uh, people that are watching those episodes, they actually agree. Uh, they see Drago in them because they're they're f- unsure like what their friends or their family might think of them if they tell them this right. or they can't do this. And then they're le- and then they're yeah. like, okay, I watched Drago uh, assure Dan that uh, we can do do this uh, and stick together. I can do that with my fam- uh, my friends, my family as well. Exactly. Yeah, I I really love that we show both sides of that. It's not just the encouraging. We can do it. Let's do it. We can do anything. But it's also the self doubt comes into it. Um, it's really neat to me to see characters that we see as so strong and heroic still have these moments of self doubt because we all do. You know, a lot of uh, media in the past has shown us that these heroes are perfect and they never make a mistake and they're always brave and they always do everything. And, you know, we could say that's a great thing to try to live up to, but that puts a lot of pressure on us. And what are we supposed to do? Just bury our feelings, push our feelings aside when we're feeling low or down or, or, you know, not great. Um, And instead, it's nice to have a support system. It's nice to deal with these emotions. It's nice to admit that we're having them. And, you know, we can't always put it on somebody else to make us feel better. That has to come from within. But it definitely is great to have a team of people saying, hey, I've been there too. I know what it's like to be down. And you were there for me. And now I'm here for you. Don't forget, you're awesome. And uh, I think that's a great thing for kids to see. Like, even when you feel self-doubt, even when you feel like you can't do something, maybe you can't but that doesn't that doesn't affect your worth as a person um and you know you get your team together and you really try and do your best to to achieve this goal and if you can't well learn from it and move on to the next one but make sure you know that you're still awesome and you know i was terrible at math when i was in high school i still am i'm I'm not a numbers guy and it used to give me a lot of stress. I was, when I was in high school, I'd keep my head down. And if a teacher called on my, my name to answer a question, face would go red. It would just feel so hot. And I would take a guess and it would be wrong. And I'm like, oh, and then they'd move on to somebody else. Or worse, she would say, no, try again. And I'd be like, I don't know what I'm doing here, man. My brain just couldn't do it. Um, partially, I wasn't interested in it. I probably could have worked a little harder at math. Um, but you know, I liked English and drama. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I worked harder in high school and, and paid a little more attention because I'd probably just have a, a more better, well-rounded education right now. I'd have more opportunities. I, I'm not great at, uh, I'm just not great at math. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, I really stressed about it at the time. Um, but I didn't really work harder at it. I just wished I was better. So the lesson i could have learned is i wish i'd worked a bit harder to understand and i wish i'd not stress as much about it and put so much pressure on myself um but yeah it's nice to see in these shows that to see some of those journeys people go on to see people have self-doubt and to find the strength within to keep going Mm -hmm. yeah and on and to be honest with you when uh, drago appeared in dance of conscious tell him that i kind of shed i nearly shed a tear (laughs) <laughs> that was great what yeah, was it like was actually cool. uh, recording that specific those specific uh, episodes like those heart to heart episodes where Drago has a deep conversation and has a deep message uh, not just to Dan but also to viewers um, yeah it's uh, 
it's tough. It's, uh, you know, you can feel it when it's supposed to be a moment that resonates. And sometimes that stuff happens during a battle. So you have to be yelling the stuff. But I always try to do a take where I say it quietly in case it'll make sense. I always try to, hey, Dan, forget everything that's happening right now. We're going to do this. And then sometimes the director goes, ah, I love it. Let's take a look to see if it matches. And then if there's like explosions or I'm flying through the air and we're not close to each other, we'll have to try one again where it's a little louder. But I really like to try to have those quiet moments too. Um, and in those moments, I wish that I could be in the room with Jonah. Um, sometimes he records his lines first. Sometimes I record mine first. So often if he's done his first, I'll say, can you play me what you have for him? So I sort of know what area he's he's in that you guys were happy with. And then I will respond to it. Or sometimes we have to say something at the same time so we get the timing. But uh, I don't know if he listens to mine if I do mine first. But it, to me, it's nice to, to sort of be on the same page. I think he does listen to uh, I think he does listen to yours. And I'm pretty sure he's just like mind blown every time he's like working with <laughs> oh i think uh if there was any novelty for jonah uh that he's working with me i think that faded a long time ago he's uh he's a professional awesome voice actor in his own right uh he i'm just probably a, a little older that's all <laughs> well, he does, well he does look up to you like a mentor figure so. you think so i well, think so that's just, from the way that i had a conversation with him <laughs> Does, it oh, does I'll have to. Way. I'll have to listen to that conversation. Good for my ego. Oh, sorry, about that. I'm going to move my uh, my iPad over to the counter here. My uh, get low on battery. So. Oh yeah, no, it. yeah, no worries. Sorry that this is taking uh, a little longer than I anticipated. Oh, not at all. Not at all. It's my fault for not uh, charging the old iPad first. And a little. Scared my dog. Oh yeah, people people wanted to know about Charlie. Let me grab Charlie. Like, oh boy, this is uh, we're in for a treat now, guys. <laughs> hey guys, this is Charlie. Hi. <laughs> Say hi, Char. <laughs> you little oh, nervous? So cute. I <laughs> I love dogs. <laughs> yeah, I'm a dog. Yeah. Lover. Uh, yeah, they're great. And Charlie's this great. is Charlie the Charlie the Bakugan dog. That's right. They should have put Charlie in the. They should have put Charlie in the reboot instead of Lightning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lightning's great. <laughs> could you, but could you imagine Will Bowes actually voicing Charlie? <laughs> I could if anyone could do it. <laughs> I think Will. <both. laughs> so, uh, so uh, just a few more questions, and then uh, you know we'll uh, we'll be uh, done. Uh, out of, so, out of all the forms that Drago has taken up uh, in in the. Uh, in the Bakugan Legacy series, in the Bakugan reboot, you know, example, uh, Maxis, Dra Maxis Drago, uh, Delta Dragonoid, uh, in the reboot, Titan Dragonoid, uh, Ma Dragonoid Maximus, so on, so on. Uh, which do you consider to be the best? Um, this is a tough one. Uh, really tough one. Some of his transformations have been temporary, and some of them have been you know evolutionary so they they build on on what he on what he was doing before um you know i i have a really soft spot for the just his original iteration i mean that's how i was introduced to him and seeing um the i got to see the diagrams of him when i was auditioning for the voice and 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 that stayed for a while um but to be honest i've lost track of all the <laughs> of all the transformations i wish i had a, a a thing in front of me i should look that up i should try to see if i can find a picture of all of drago's maximus maximus is pretty dope maximus um, dragonoid yeah oh dragonoid this, maximus yeah. yes dragonoid maximus yeah that uh that's pretty pretty rad <laughs> but um a couple of them felt a little too humanoid to me where it's almost like he kind of was slimmed down and standing straight oh yes like, from like my uh, uh, surge uh, and so and yeah so forth. yeah that those ones uh i connect to a little less i, I like the ones that are a little bit more beast like i think yeah but i like the streamlined ones i don't like a ton of stuff on his shoulders and stuff where it looks like he can't move like it looks like ben affleck as batman oh i like uh <laughs> i like him streamlined but beast like like 
very maneuverable and able to fly and everything. Uh, it's a tough decision. I mean, uh, some of those characters, some of those evolutions, uh, I played a little differently. Like when he first gets the evolution, he's a bit bigger and, and badder. Um, and then there was, uh, there was a version, I think, last year where... Did he kind of go, like, purple or something? There was one where he, like... I feel like he went darker, and there was a different Drago. Like, there were two Dragos. Um, um, that was Geoforce Dragonoid, I believe. Okay. Wow, you're you're good. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember them all, because, like, I'm so focused on the moment uh, about what's happening, and there are so many moments in every episode, and we've done so many episodes, that it really is all... People really have to remind me <laughs> to know what's going on. You play too many Dragonoids in your time to like. <laughs> yeah, all. yeah. Speaking of like the and original some... Dragonoid, I actually have one. <laughs> hey, hey nice. One. What's the number? What uh, what number do you got? Do you have on that one? Uh, crud. Let's see. Uh, can't I think I have one like that this too. But he's a. Four, this one has four hundred G power. Nice. Uh, but the number I think crud I. I think it might have faded away. This is one of the first ones because uh, you know because uh, right. the magnet is exposed and yes. it's smaller yeah. than uh, the new newer B two ones. I've got one of those too. Uh, not handy, but I think mine is only two hundred Gs. So uh, you'd win. You'd beat me. No, <laughs> well, I guess not necessarily. No, I could never. I could never beat uh, Drag. I could never beat me, <laughs> Drago. <laughs> I'm pretty sure if Drago oh. stood in front of me right now and just like tearing over, I'm like, I'll give you, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you don't, if you don't burn me to death. <laughs> I'll have to remember that because at the conventions when I play people, I always lose. So uh, using intimidation might be the way to, to the way to win. Just make people walk away. No, I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> There's this thing uh, that me that uh, me and Julius, uh, who voices Magnus, uh, did. Uh, his Bakugan is Nilius, who's the two-headed uh, black dragon. So there's a yeah. form that Nilius has is where if you have Magnus, he gains plus f plus ten uh, damage. So we did this thing where like, oh, so since you're Ma you're Magnus yourself, you don't actually need the Magnus card. You can <laughs> just go. <you know. laughs> so we auto he automatically gets the bonus just for playing the game just exactly, because he's him. Exactly. So <laughs> I got a feeling if you play. Uh, the game, and then you have there's a form for Dragonoid called Titan Dragonoid, uh, where if you have Dan Kuzo, he gets plus two thousand B power. <laughs> so he becomes oh, three thousand okay. B power. So if so, I got a feeling if you play, if you have Jonah Weinberg right next to you, then you would automatically oh, get the bonus. Yeah. You don't need the Dan Kuzo card. <laughs> there you go. We're unstoppable, even in real life. Yeah, I, I feel like that means I should just recuse myself from any Bakugan battles i think i have an unfair advantage <laughs> or actually so the truth is i just play terribly so dragon Eye maximus's card actually is the first ever uh instant win con so like if you have dan winton and leah on the field you automatically win oh man so if you okay. have jonah devin and margarita like standing behind you and then you play dragon Eye maximus Dream. you win <laughs> Well, we should probably start a soccer team or something. We just show up and go, well, you guys can go home. We automatically win. <laughs> uh, we're on sports league. Uh, yeah, and all of us, all of those people you just mentioned, too, we were we were at a convention together a couple of years ago, which was pretty cool. We did a panel um, where we all got to talk. So, yeah, me, Jonah, Margarita, and, uh, and Devin were all there. And Julius, too. Uh, yeah, that was pretty cool. Oh, I, think I think that was I the last time. Ever... Which convention you're talk you were talking about? Because uh, I think Jonah posted it one time on his uh, Instagram. Yeah, it's the only one we've done together. I think it was... Oh, what was it? I think it was uh, was Toronto, it a... wasn't it? It was in Toronto, yeah. and it was... I think it might have been an anime convention. Um, there were some games and stuff there, too, I think. Yeah, I... <laughs> I wish <laughs> we've done a few. I wish I'd gone. Uh, what? I have like four, I have like four thousand things for you to sign. <laughs> <laughs> where uh, where are you? Where are you based? Uh, Winnipeg. Winnipeg, Manitoba. Okay, cool. Nice. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, so there's also there's a Calgary Fan Expo um, that I haven't made it out to yet, um, and I'm sure there's something in Winnipeg too, right? Uh, Winnipeg. We usually have a Comic Con. That's about it. Yeah. Okay. When do you do that? Uh, Comic Con up here uh, happens in October. There is an anime convention that happens in the summer. Oh, 
It's called okay. Icon, which is Anime Con. <laughs> right. But uh, nice. But uh, yeah, come, come but that happen, yeah that happens in like the summer. There are some people that sometimes go there. Those things. Cool. Well, maybe uh, maybe it'll work out this year. Maybe uh, maybe maybe this fall. Uh, my birthday's in October. Maybe I'll celebrate in Winnipeg with uh, with the Comic Con. <laughs> oh, and you know what? If uh, if you come to Winnipeg, you're welcome. To, you're welcome to my house. I'll treat you to anything you want. All you have to do is just sign one thing for me. <laughs> Which thing would that be? Uh, that would be this actually. If I could just get it, this right here, the the uh, limited edition Bakugan. This is the first ever limited edition, and it features the uh, Dragonoids. <laughs> Look like, at special that! Special translucent I've, plastic. I've never seen this in real life. You, this is. You uh, never gave this to you. Well, they can't be giving away everything. They have a lot of stuff. Um, they've given me some nice things over the years for sure, but no, I haven't, I haven't seen this. This is, uh, this is special. Um, so where would you, I wonder if a gold Sharpie might be the best for this, like on the, uh, black, where, one, where would would you, be, black one would be fine too, or, uh, it's either silver or white. I don't know if I want you to sign like, the card or the box. That's the thing. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause that's a silver logo on the top. I think my, I think in silver just beneath it might be nice. Oh yeah, def but. yeah, definitely. And if you can, you know, <laughs> if you can sign this, this will actually probably make my collection. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe you could put it in a little framed box on the wall or something like that, or a special shelf. Yeah, <laughs> actually, I do have a special shelf for like all my Drago toys. I think I showed them I on see Twitter it? one time. Uh, oh, that, yeah, I'm not on Twitter anymore, but uh, yeah, can, can you move the camera? Can I see it? Oh, I can't move the camera. I'll send you a picture right after. Oh. Though. Okay. Okay, that's good. Well, put put it in put it in the Discord or wherever you show this, so other people can see your shelf. Cause yeah, I, I think we can share it with everybody. I don't have a shelf at the moment, but I do. Uh, yeah, I do have. I wrestled this away from Charlie the other day, so I've got the. Oh, the that OG. that right there is a that right there yeah. is a collection. <laughs> so that is something that uh, that Spin Master gave to me years ago. So yeah, it's got the whole whole set. Oh, and so so, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it says Teletoon Presents. It's got Novana on there. Yeah, pretty neat. Pretty G. Includes volumes one to five. So yeah, it's a pretty uh, pretty decent little set. I think like uh, not a. I think the two people uh, that probably survived the uh, Legacy series that came over to the reboot series was uh, Stacy DePass and Rob Tinkler. Uh, yeah, there's there's also. Um, Oh, I'm blanking on his name now. He's uh, <laughs> he's also in the show Letter Kenny, and he's come back a few times to play the announcer. Um, do you know who I mean? Announcer. Um, uh, announcer. Oh, I'm such a jerk. Uh, that I I'm blanking on his name. Uh, da, 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 da. uh Dan Petronj of Oh, Petronjev. Dan Petronjevac. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. So he, he was in, yeah, yeah. Uh, he came back to, to do some announcer stuff because I think in the original he was like, "No, we're battling!" Like he did that kind of stuff. He, he's he also uh, he's actually also Halcor and uh, Strata and uh, the main villain of season two, Havoc. Man, you're good. You're good. Oh, I'd love to. Ha I'd love to bring Havoc back again. You know who I'd also love to bring back is uh, I don't know if you remember from the original series, Preus. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Sean Mounier um, is such a, a great voice actor and, and friend of mine, and he played Preus, and at conventions, people went nuts for him, man, because he brought so much comedy to it. Like, he helped really shape that character. He had that cool voice, and he had all these neat abilities and stuff, and uh, it was always fun to have him in the show. I think that's a character that they, they could bring back and people would love. I would actually really... I think it would be a lot of fun, and it might be crazy, and the and the producers might hate me for putting this into the world because the fans might go nuts. But imagine we did some kind of uh, cross rip reality thing, like Spider Man No Way Home, and we had the OG universe collide with the new one, and we needed everyone from both series to battle a new threat. Maybe Nilius comes back or something like that. But uh, how fun would it be to have both Dan's uh, you know, the legacy cast, maybe even playing older versions 
uh, of those characters. Uh, yes. I think that could be a lot of fun. You know that. Uh, ev- you know, ever since uh, ever since Champions of Destroyer, everybody wanted in a, 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 a cross universe uh, crossover, maybe like as a movie or something. You know what uh, uh, Teen Titans and Teen Titans Go did, and as you said, Spider Man yeah. No Way Home. Uh, I know. think that'd be so much fun, and I'd I'd love to play like a Drago from the first series who's now ten years older. Maybe he's got a gray streak and is. Uh, <laughs> his uh, horns or something like that and then him meeting the other drago and them talking to each other the two dan's talking to each other maybe the original dan is like in his 30s now i think that'd be a lot of fun so like uh if it actually does become reality and uh you get to play drago and drago does that mean you would get double billing <laughs> i i i don't know if i'd get paid twice and that's okay but i would love to have my credit twice in the in the credits that'd be funny Jason Deline is Drago. Jason Deline is Drago. <laughs> Jason Deline is Drago number one. Jason Deline is Drago number two. <laughs> yeah, but oh man, if we, it would be just such a great excuse to get as many of those um, original cast members back. I to, uh, yeah, I actually that was actually my uh, next question to you. Which Bakugan from the legacy would you like want to be brought into the reboot? Because we got like Hydronoid coming back, Cycloid came back, and uh, yeah, yeah, you answered it, Prius. And I know there's a lot of people Prius. that want actually want Prius to come back. <laughs> he was such a unique look too. Like he was, he was very cool the way he moved and uh, and in his style, he was less beast like and a lot more humanoid like. Some kind of like amphibious guy, and then there was and you'll know this probably better than me. There was like an evil version of Preus too, right? Yeah, Preus and he was a different Diablo. color. Pre- Preus Diablo, yeah, that was uh, that was a lot of fun too. Yeah, that that would probably be the character. I mean, there's a lot of great cast members and characters I'd love to see back, but Sean Munier as Preus was a uh, was very unique, and I I think the fans would go crazy for that. I would love <laughs> to see uh, Scott McCord and Jonah Weinberg just uh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be hilarious. That'd be so much fun. I, I think I think I think the most fun would be if they aged up the the characters from the original series. I think it'd be really cool to see an adult Dan um, giving some advice to the young Dan. Yeah, and uh, yeah. I they think didn't, people like that kind of thing. Yeah, they didn't finish like uh the original series that uh like that well, right? right? There was no ending kind of thing of yeah. the series. Uh but so it would be cool because like uh you know how in Spider Man No Way Home, uh Tommy Maguire's Spider Man Spoilers <laughs> Yes, yeah, spoilers, uh, spoilers right there. Tommy Maguire, spo- uh, Spider Man. They just mentions like what he's been doing after Spider Man Three. Yeah, yeah, and then it kind of indicated that he's it's complicated, but he's worked stuff out with Mary Jane, and uh, uh, it was interesting to see you know Andrew Garfield's character um, still sort of suffering from the losses he had, but he was able to redeem himself with that moment replayed, like the mm-hmm. Gwen Stacy was now MJ, and I thought they did a a, a really great job of giving some closure to those characters and even the bad guys and the idea of like curing them. And, and I loved seeing, uh, Toby and Alfred Molina have another moment again as, yeah. uh, as Peter and, uh, and, and Dr. Uh, Octavius. Cause, uh, cause they had such a lovely relationship in Spider-Man too. And then to have that closure, I think was really beautiful. So, uh, you know, I, I think we could definitely do that kind of thing with Bakugan to sort of wink at the audience and say, this is the OG cast sort of passing the torch, uh, and just having one last adventure and, and to have us know that yeah in our universe we actually achieved peace and we don't have any more invasions and now we just battle for fun um but now there's this greater th- threat that is threatening various universes so we need them to help and so dan and uh drag will figure out some way to open a portal to that universe and pull them in you know uh maybe it's a little bit too similar <laughs> to things that have already happened but I think there's a way to do it that could be really fun and really exciting, and uh, I think the fans would enjoy it. You'd be 100% on board with that, huh? <laughs> Me? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, you know, I love how far they can go with these crazy stories in these shows, and uh, I think so many of the fans of this new series are also fans of the previous series, and I just think that would be a nice little love letter to those fans to bring in the OGs one more time. To know that we haven't, like forgotten about that haven't left it in the dust that we still respect what came before and that you know without that series and all those actors and all those fans we wouldn't be where we are now so 
I would definitely love to be able to say thank you one last time to that original cast. Yeah, and you know what? Thank you so thank you so much for being Drago. You know, it's uh, <laughs> like in the previous series, and also coming back now. You know, nobody like it's uh, like uh, it's like uh, James Earl James Earl Jones as Darth Vader. We can't imagine anybody else in that <laughs> in uh, in that role. Wow. Well, that's a uh, that's a, a really uh, complimentary comparison. That's that's very sweet, and I and I thank you for that. It's it's always. Um, fulfilling as an actor for someone to say uh you you're unique in this character and no one else could do it you know it's uh because it, it does become a part of you as you play a character for so long you're really invested in these stories and and bringing truth to your character and playing it authentically and and you're trying to serve the fans uh who who are really into it you know you never want to phone it in uh, or do something that is against type. I've I've been in the studio many times where I've said, someone else should say this line, or can I say this line differently? Because Drago wouldn't do this, or Drago wouldn't say that. And there's only so much we can do because it's already been animated, right? Um, yeah. But uh, but there are some things that I can I can sort of alter. Sometimes it's like slang, or it's contractions, um, and I say, you know. Drago is trying to learn and be modern and stuff, but there are some things that he just wouldn't say or wouldn't do. I almost think of him as being a fan of Shakespeare or something like a, oh. like <laughs> I just think he's very a very strong orator. He really likes to communicate with you know excellent precision and uh, and sometimes that's fun. He he comes off a little stiff sometimes, and so paired with a relaxed person like Dan, that makes for a more fun. Um, sort of juxtaposition you know they complement each other well they're they're like a buddy cop sort of show <laughs> yeah exactly exactly that's kind of how i see or ash and pikachu right <laughs> exactly yeah 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 it's fun to sort of have those opposites that somehow come together and form the perfect team and it's like unbreak this like unbreakable bond you can't imagine drago be teaming up with anybody else and all that yeah totally mm -hmm. oh i just remembered i would also love to bring uh, Dan's father back from the original series because uh, he just had this weird obsession with pudding that I thought was really funny. Oh, um, um, yes, I remember. Pudding! <laughs> <laughs> like uh, like when uh, time freezes, then all of a sudden uh, he's dropping the pudding, then when the time yeah. stops freezing after the battle's over, my pudding! <laughs> yeah, I, like that. that is just a, a lovely kind of fun recurring type of gag that you see in a lot of things that come from japan that we don't always put in north american stuff and i love that comedic sensibility that just it's okay to be a little bit goofy once in a while when the stakes are so high in other scenes it's important to have that levity so people have something to laugh at you know the bakugan shorts have been really fun to do too just those, oh, yes those tiny <laughs> stories where they're just all goofing around and being silly like it's nice to show a different side of them all you know when they're not just waiting for the world to explode yeah <laughs> it's fun to see the new situation so i so yeah. you would so like uh you would say like earlier you said that like, you want havoc to come back so i so i'm gonna assume that havoc is their favorite villain to fight against in this whole series you know honestly i i've i've always considered nilius as my um sort of um main uh, antagonist uh, he was he was around a lot in the original series and he just seemed to be the one who was threatening the whole existence of the Stroya, the existence of earth and he kind of felt like a similar creature to drago he seemed very assured very powerful he was like the anti-drago and opposite of drago i would consider nilius my nemesis um i would love to to fight him again yeah, so like what you were describing, I think you were talking about Hydronoid uh, in like the previous series. Uh, you were talking about what? Sorry? I think what you were describing with Nilius in the previous series, I think you were talking about Hydronoid. Because uh, like uh, Nilius is like a new Bak is a new Bakugan in the reboot. Uh, so, but oh, but yeah, I but yeah, there has been comparisons uh, to like dual oh, Hydronoid. No, it's not. Nil he was a white almost dragon looking oh guy. naga naga sorry i i th i think of naga whenever i say nilius in the new one because i'm like nilius uh and i used to be naga 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, I would love Naga to come back because Naga to me felt like sort of like if Drago was Sherlock Holmes, Naga was Moriarty. Like he felt like he was smart as well as powerful, not just a thug. And, you know, like a good Bond villain. He just seemed to have a big, scary plan, and he seemed very capable. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I haven't seen Naga in a long time, and he was the one that I felt scared Drago. And so I think that's interesting. Someone that was a real threat to, to Drago because of his intelligence. Uh, I'd like to see more of that. Yeah, I would definitely <laughs> like to see Naga come back, actually. We can probably have Naga cool. be the antagonist of the next season, maybe. <laughs> that would be really cool. I'd love, to, I'd love to see Naga and Preyas come back next season. Yeah, and, we need uh, those. And we then, need those two back because they brought back Leonidas from the uh, Battle Brawlers game. That's right. Oh yeah, Leonidas is awesome. Um, yeah, I, I think it'd be really fun if, like, for some reason, I was paired up with Preyas to fight Naga. And and Preyas is just driving me nuts because he's just so goofy. But I need him, and he doesn't uh, eventually help me defeat Naga. And then I have a new appreciation for Preyas. Uh, I think that would be a really cool arc. That would be a re- <laughs> that would be a really cool story to tell on the reboot series. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think it'd be fun. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but, and also speaking of Naga, what do you think of like bringing Wavern back, maybe? <laughs> Because I think oh, that's an interesting yeah. dynamic to give to Drago, having Drago have a sort of a love interest. A bit of a romance, yeah, yeah. I think that would be nice to bring to bring her back for sure. Um, I, I loved uh, I loved that character, and I loved the dynamic, and I think we could explore it more. Yeah, I, I, I like the idea of, of having emotional connections between the Bakugan and and to show that they actually have their own sort of life and uh, and things that are important to them. You know, they're not just animals or, or um, non-sentient beings they they have the full spectrum of human emotion that we have so yeah I'd like to, I'd like to see more of that I'd like to see maybe Drago reflect on reflect on the loss of Wavern if if this version of him is even still aware of of her um, but yeah I think it'd be nice to bring her back and have that have that between them for sure so as we're recording this podcast right now, Evolutions is still going on. We're at the seventh episode now. Uh, but mm-hmm. and, but already, if you've seen my reviews, I've already talked about how Dan is going through a sort of character arc. I'm not going to spoil it for you uh, all. So <laughs> you can go back and watch my reviews as I explain like what Dan is going through. But I got to ask you this thing, uh, just uh, but without any spoilers, though, what can we expect <laughs> to see from Drago in Evolutions right now? Oh, what can, well, what can I tell you? Um, well, I think you're going to see Drago and Dan's friendship, partnership tested a few times, um, where Drago is maybe not sure where Dan's coming from some of the time. Um, Dan's motivations aren't always clear. And sometimes that happens the opposite, too. So there there may be a, a bit of a crisis of faith here and there wondering what's going on with their friend uh why aren't we working together as well as we used to and you know there's a bit of a mystery why people are acting the way they are and sometimes it might make sense sometimes it might not but um as you're watching it just send good vibes um keep believing in dan and drago so we'll make it through this okay we need you we need your positive vibes (laughs) i don't really want to say much more than that honestly it's it's uh you know you know what you're in for with bakugan big action scenes uh crazy sci-fi storylines the world ending uh different types of energies creating different obstacles and dangers uh you know they're in for a rough ride and uh, it may end on a cliffhanger, or it may not. Um, and then hopefully, we'll be back again before too long to to give you more stories. <laughs> that is already so interesting, and I'm already so ex- like my heart is already pumping. I'm already so excited to watch the rest of Evolutions. <laughs> Good. <laughs> like I like I'm like that's it. I need to I need to watch this. Can you get the episodes already? I need to watch what happens now. <laughs> the way you describe some it, of this. 
Tense. <laughs> Some of the most uh, the tense ones for me are when we end a season where it, it appears that Drago has sacrificed himself and like gone through a portal to another world and not coming back, and then we start the next season where he comes back and everyone's like, "Ooh, phew, good, Drago." Oh okay. yes, from uh, <laughs> Armored Alliance, uh, the, the uh, Drago and everyone else has to sleep, and then he comes back in third season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because a superhero landing. Stuff. Yes! Oh, I love doing those. That's fun. <clears throat> yeah. It, it's uh, it's a bit of a workout, I tell you, doing some of these battle scenes and trying to keep it interesting. You don't want every punch to sound the same. You don't want every effort someone hits you or fall on the ground. So we do. We spend a lot of time doing that stuff. <laughs> and then getting up. And then maybe mad, like, it's not over yet. <laughs> I, I love those fun lines like yeah, yeah you shouldn't have turned your back on me yeah. you know <laughs> yeah the action scenes is like awesome and uh, the reboots and uh, it's and like honestly uh, when uh, uh, what was I going to say uh, I lost my train of thought because like I'm so focused on like how good the action scenes uh, looked <laughs> like I loved how the animations uh, looked and stuff and, uh, it's I, a lot of fun. I, I love the 2D animation, just blended sometimes with some 3D stuff, usually in the evolution stuff. Um, yeah, it's you know a lot of a lot of animated movies now have gone the 3D route, and uh, while I, I love that stuff and I think it's gorgeous, I think we it, it doesn't always have the same level of detail and realism that that, uh, that hand drawn and uh, 2D animation has. And I, I love that we still have a lot of that detail and uh, beautiful movement in these shows, you know. Um, not a lot of animation has the budget where they can have all these separate environments and, and animations for the characters and beautiful uh, effects and light and battle, you know. You, we don't, you don't see them reuse fight sequences or, or background panels like like in some other shows where they don't have the budget for it or whatever um but yeah they, it, uh, you can tell it's a labor of love with those artists they just make it beautiful mm -hmm. yeah and the animations are definitely beautiful oh right i and remember fan art I, saw, too. I've seen I remember people uh, brought me fan art that is uh, gorgeous their own versions of of drago and i've seen people draw a uh, drago as a, a human woman and i'm just like that is such an amazing idea and it looks incredible and you definitely see Drago and yeah, it's great what fans do to sort of make this their own. I it's think awesome. I saw that actually. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> I remember seeing that somewhere, but I can't, don't it might have been on Instagram. Top of my head where I saw it, but yeah, that's pretty, yeah, that, yeah. Cool. there's a, quite a bit of uh, Drago fan art and like Bakugan fan art in general. Like, yeah, there. there's some, there's some animators in the making who watch the show for sure. I, I love seeing fans draw stuff. And they're just, you know, improving their skills all the time. And uh, I know they're going to get out in the world and do something with it. And that's really neat, too, to see, to sort of see it come full circle. Like, I, I, I haven't met anyone who's animated on the show. I've, I've met uh, the, the team from, from uh, Japan. They, uh, the creators of Bakugan came when we were recording the original one. And uh, it was really cool. They were all very sweet and complimentary. And there was man, one man who uh, who didn't speak English, uh, but he shook my hand and he nodded and he was very kind. And then um, at the end, when they left, he just looked at me and said, goodbye, Drago. And I was like, ah, oh. he called me Drago. Uh, the creators of this thing, I thought to me that was their blessing saying that, you know, you're Drago. <laughs> you definitely are was, Drago, no question about it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I think this will it'll be with me for the rest of my life, and I'm and I'm happy to carry it. Um, it's a it's a wonderful character. I'm proud to play, and uh, it makes me so happy that so many people find joy in it. <laughs> I'm it's so impressed of how you can keep being Drago after all these years. Because I remember seeing you in an interview when Bakugan first came out. There was an interview you did uh, where they were asking like what like it was it was inside the recording studio and they were asking you about Bakugan yeah. and you're and uh, mm -hmm. I remember you said that uh, doing all the growls and stuff and all that hurt your vocal cords a little bit, but you say <laughs> it's worth it because Bakugan is so awesome. Yeah. Well, I've learned a few lessons since then. I've, I've learned more about vocal placements and breathing and, and how to make things sound like that without straining my voice. And I've also learned uh, that we save the battle sounds to the end of our recording session to make sure that I can say all the dialogue clearly. 
So, so if we did all the sounds at the beginning, hey Dan, oh, <laughs> it can get a little tiring. But uh, but no, I'm I'm better at protecting my throat now, so it doesn't hurt anymore. <laughs> and, you, and you know what, Bach, and uh, you know what? Uh, just one more question for you, uh, just uh, just to wrap this up. Uh, so, uh, besides acting, uh, what other hobbies do you enjoy? Well, um, I don't know if it would be considered a hobby, but I love racing my dog with my wife, Helena. Uh, Helena is also an actor and, and voice actor. Uh, so we bounce ideas off each other and uh, record each other in the studio and things like that. But yeah, our, our dog's a big source of joy in our life. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I've had a dog since I was four years old. And uh, they're amazing animals. It's just such a, a great way to learn about taking care of another life and being empathetic. And uh, so that brings a lot of joy. We go on hikes here in Vancouver. There's so many beautiful places in the mountains to hike. Um, I like snowboarding, rock climbing. Uh, I'm a bit of a, a gamer. Uh, I have a PS5, so I play, uh, I play quite a bit on there. Um, I see you have a Mortal Kombat 2 arcade uh, in the background of your... <laughs> yeah. How's there? Thank you. And there's, uh, there's a Neutrona wand on top of that oh. uh, from Ghostbusters. And, and that clock on the wall is the Back to the Future clock that runs backwards. So, uh, oh. yeah, I'm a bit of a, a, bit of a geek for the, the 80s and 90s stuff. Yeah, Mortal Kombat is uh, something I'm a huge fan of. Um, always always love that stuff. Here's, a, here's another thing I got. Let's see if I can help hold it together. This is uh, Bookends. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, that classic. is so cool. <laughs> Uh, the spear broke off, uh, but there's the kunai, uh, Scorpion's kunai, is going right through all the books and out through. Probably some super glue would be uh, would, uh, would work. Yeah, I fixed it a couple of times. It just gets time to knock it balls, but uh, yeah. So and, and I play guitar as well. Uh, I play guitar and sing. Uh, I enjoy karaoke. Uh, I don't should have written a. A Drago song for you or something. <laughs> Drago is a dragon that I like. To, oh, I got the Drago is a dragon that I like to play. If I could, I'd play Drago every day. Booster Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, they should, uh, Spin Master should actually release an EP for you. <laughs> Oh man, songs by Drago. That would be a really weird album. Uh, songs about friendship. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Already, yeah. so, Booster Dragon was the thing that I used to say all the time. That was my signature uh, move in the at least the first season of yes. the original series. Um, <laughs> I like to bring that back. Yeah, I don't. I don't say the the moves as much anymore. Usually now, uh, Dan says it, and I go, "Okay, Dan," and then just go. Bruh! Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I missed the old days. Someone in the discard the other day, I think, actually asked. They, they said, "Bring the boosted dragon back or something." Oh, yes. <laughs> um, that's not up to me. But yeah, they, they they made some changes in some of those moves for the new series. But yeah, I, I like saying that one. Boosted dragon. I yeah, I really like. We gotta like get on get on Twitter. <laughs> uh, two things we want from Drago: an EP and also boosted dragon. <laughs> Hey man, yeah, put some push some hashtags out. You never know, and and of course, if you uh, if you want me at a convention somewhere you live, you gotta contact those guys because uh, I love coming out and meeting the meeting the fans, man. It's so much fun, uh, especially the real young ones who are who are just learning for the first time that it's actually an actor who voices the character. And you say this is Drago, and they're like, oh, and I go, hello, Earth Child, and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's super fun, and uh, and it's really the only chance to get to meet the fans is doing these conventions because they know you're going to be there. We don't, voice actors don't typically get recognized on the street. Yeah, which is like a good the, thing. Behind the booth and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they always change their voice every time, like when they appear on camera. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, uh, convention-wise, uh, I think Anime Expo might be the best uh convention because like they host a bakugan tournament there uh i know in 2019 it was pretty it was pretty big uh 
And yeah, I think I was supposed to host it one year, uh, and I wasn't able to. Devin so, went yeah, to I, uh, the 2019 one, though. So. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, cool. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you never know. If, if my schedule allows and, uh, and, the, and Winnipeggers are open to it, we'll see. I think we would be open. I think we would be open to it. All right. All right. Yeah. We'll figure but, it out. But uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, Bakugan Evolutions is uh, season four of Bakugan, and uh, and it's and I th- and uh, it, you know uh, the original series I think ended at four seasons because I think Mectanium Surge might be the last one. Uh, I think so. Yeah, but uh, it's so but it's so amazing that Bakugan is continuing to grow as we've seen in the uh, second quarter uh, earnings for 2021 in Spin Master. They are confident in continuing to invest in Spin Master beyond. Uh, beyond uh 2021s and 2022 yeah yeah it's great it's uh it's a heck of a thing people seem to like it so uh you know i hope we keep making more and there was talk a while ago about a live action movie uh they had a director attached and i was attached to play drago but uh what? that was that was years ago i don't think it's still uh on imdb anymore but uh yeah near the end of the first uh the first series they were talking live action and probably a CGI Drago. So, uh, oh geez, that would be pretty wild. I don't know if it would work, but I, I think it would be interesting. I think <laughs> I think they put the CGI Drago in the Bakugan commercials for the reboot, though. Oh yeah, right, right. <laughs> the live action commercials for the reboot had CGI Drago and Nilius. <laughs> yeah, those were interesting, different. <laughs> yeah, uh, but honestly, live act like when you said that there was, there was talk a live action movie, I'm like. <gasps> Because there was specul, because everybody wants it, and there was speculation about it uh, before, yeah. but it turned out to be fake. <laughs> but yeah, now now there's even more excitement about the property. So uh, who knows? It'd be pretty wild. It'd be fun. I mean, Paw Patrol <laughs> got a movie, so and I True. think if Bakugan does well, I think it might uh, have a movie as well soon. Yeah, <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, one, but uh, yeah, I think we're gonna wrap this up here. And uh, Jason, thank you so much for uh, joining us on the Baku Talking Longer podcast. It's such an honor. Thank you so much again for uh, joining us. It's been my pleasure. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm glad we finally got to connect. And uh, thanks to everybody who watches the show and is watching this interview. You're appreciated. Yeah, thank, and thank you so much, Jason, for being Drago. And once again, congratulations on four seasons of the Bakugan okay. reboot. And hopefully, we will have more seasons to come. But th- uh, thank you so much again for watching the Baku Talk and Longer podcast. Support Baku Talk by pressing the thumbs up and give us a subscribe for more awesome Bakugan content. I've been Haru Ren. This has been Jason DeLine. And thank God for Rapid Fire.